All right, so this morning we will be in Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to look at the first nine verses, verses 1 through 9. And the title of the message this morning is Peace in an Anxious and Unruly World. Peace in an Anxious and Unruly World. So devotionally, over the past few weeks, I've been reading through, I've been studying through the epistle to the Philippians. And um, it has really ministered to me, especially in the times that we're living in right now. And as we gather here this morning, there's no question about it. We're living in some extremely unsettling times. You think about a time filled with division. I mean, you think about our country alone, the political divisiveness, the social divisiveness. You think about division within our family, amongst our friends, even amongst the church. Um, anxieties and worries that are filling our hearts. You think about the pandemic, the conspiracy theories galore floating around. Uh, you think about the immoral laws that are being passed, all of these things that are occurring uh, within our country, within our world. And, you know, sometimes we even have that fear of being silenced, being controlled, and often we forget that God always has the last word. And so many people are just trying to find peace in this temporary world you know, through a politician, through a movement, just anything that this world has to offer. And what I love about the Word of God is the Word of God always gets us in the right alignment, in the right direction, where we should be looking. And this morning we're going to see here through uh, Philippians, through the Apostle Paul, that he addresses these issues of division and anxieties and worries. And of course, that peace that we're so seeking every single day um, with the Lord. And of course, we know that this is only peace that we can have through Jesus Christ, a peace that surpasses all understanding. And we'll talk more about what that actually means. Because remember what the Lord tells us in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace in the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Okay? So just a little bit of background here, and then I'll get into a moment of prayer before we get into the word together. Um, so here in this letter, this epistle to the Philippians, if you remember, Paul visited Philippi during his second missionary journey. And if you look at Acts chapter 16, it kind of gives you kind of a historical uh, view of that. If you remember, while in Troas, Paul had this vision of a man. And this man told him, hey, come. Come to Macedonia and um, help us. So Paul, along with Timothy, Silas, and Luke, they made their way to Macedonia and eventually to Philippi. And when you think about that, um, kind of remember those notable conversions that took, their, took place there in Philippi. You think about Lydia, for example, the first individual to be converted on the continent of Europe. You think about the Philippian jailer, right? Um, Paul and Silas were thrown into prison after they had removed that spirit of uh, divination or that foretelling spirit from that young woman. And they threw them in prison. And then in the middle of the night, they were singing praises and hymns on to the Lord. And there was this big earthquake. The prisoners were set free. And it opened up that opportunity for them to minister to that Philippian jailer and eventually um, his household. And here in this letter, if you look at the very first chapter of Philippians, um, he is writing to the church there. He mentions the saints. He mentions the bishops and the deacons, right? The elders and the overseers, the leaders there. And he writes this letter while he is imprisoned in Rome. This is one of his prison epistles. And he thanks them, the Philippians, for a monetary gift that was taken to them. And if you remember, an individual named Epaphroditus, uh, if you look at the fourth chapter, the latter part of the fourth chapter, even in chapter two of Philippians, it talks about Epaphroditus. He goes to Paul, delivers this gift to him in his time of need. But also what's interesting about this individual is that he stayed with Paul for a while and he almost died. He became very ill. And by the grace of God, he was healed and ultimately delivered this letter back uh, to uh, the church there in Philippi. And if you read through uh, Philippians, and I encourage you to do that, it's only four chapters, uh, you're going to see some themes as you read through it there. Uh, one of the themes there is speaking God's word with boldness, and that's certainly something that we need to do in these days, even in the midst of difficulty and persecution. 
like-mindedness, humility. We'll talk more about that uh, this morning. And then he also talks about joy, thanksgiving, rejoicing always in the Lord. And uh, that we will also talk about this morning. But before we actually get into the text, let me uh, open up in, in prayer. And then I will read the text and we'll look at it verse by verse uh, this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to come here and to just hear from you in your word. We pray that you would soften our hearts, soften our minds, Lord, that any distractions, anything we brought in here with us, Lord, that we would just lay it at your feet. Help us to have understanding, Lord, by your spirit. Fill us, fill this place, Lord, with the power and the person of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me, that I would decrease and that you would increase, Lord, that whatever it is you desire for me to say, that I would say it and that you would just minister to us as you see fit. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. The Apostle Paul writes here, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntaki to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. So notice here, uh, Paul, he's writing once again to the Philippians, and it's applicable to everyone today. Um, in order to have that peace in our lives, the very first thing he mentions here is having that Christ-mindedness, right? That like-mindedness, being single-minded. And that is our first point this morning, is be Christ-minded. And that's going to be verses 1 through 3. If you look at that first verse, Paul writes there once again, he says, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast, in the Lord, beloved. So notice here, Paul is speaking to his brothers and his sisters in Christ. He's encouraging them to stand fast, right? To stay fixed um, in the Lord. And then he also mentions, he calls them his joy and his crown. And, you know, you're thinking, crown? What does he mean by crown there? Now, if you look in the original Greek language, that word crown there is uh, Stephanos. Okay, Stephanos. And that word, refers to a crown of achievement. If you look in the Strong's Concordance, it's the wreath of or garland, which was given as a prize to victors in public places. So as the Philippians stood fast in the Lord, they abided in the Lord, they became more Christ-minded, they would be Paul's prize. They would be his crown. They would be his reward. Now remember, the Bible speaks of a judgment that all believers will face. And that is what we call the judgment seat of Christ. If you look at Romans 14, beginning in verse 10 uh, through 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 10, there it speaks about the judgment seat of Christ. And that judgment is not for our sins, right? That was taken care of at the cross. However, the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment where believers will be rewarded for what they did for the Lord while they were on this earth. So this is reward beyond salvation, okay? And the judgment seat of Christ, like I said, that is just for rewards. It is not for sin. 
of our sins. And Paul's labor there at the church in, Phil in uh, Philippi, Paul knew that they would be his reward as he labored for them, as they abided in the Lord. Uh, the Lord would reward him for his work there. And just for completion here, if you look throughout scripture, there's actually five crowns that are mentioned. Okay. Um, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 5 in verses 2 through 4, that speaks of the crown of glory, okay? And that's for a position of oversight while on this earth. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 speaks of the imperishable crown, okay? And that's running God's race with great endurance. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. That's the crown of righteousness, and that's the all looking for and loving his appearing. First Thessalonians 2.19 speaks of the crown of rejoicing, and that's the soul winning crown. And then James chapter 1 verse 12 speaks of the crown of life. That's for faithful endurance, enduring temptations, testings, and trials. So, of course, we know that our salvation is not going to come from that specific judgment seat of Christ. That judgment, once again, is for reward beyond salvation. Remember what Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9, that by grace through faith we have been saved, right? It's not our good works. Those good works are a result of our faith, but those works are not going to save us. It's our faith in the Lord because of his towards us, right? 1 John 2, 2 tells us, and he, speaking of Jesus, is the propitiation, the appeasement, right, the satisfaction for our sins, but not just our sins, but the sins of the entire world. So I love this introduction here because here we kind of see a glimpse of Paul's heart, how we love this church, this church that he was able to establish and now he's checking in on them. He calls them beloved. He loves them. They're his joy. And he knew they would also at some point be his reward because of all the labor um, that he you know, endured for the purposes of them being closer uh, to the Lord. Now, in verses 2 through 3, we see Paul addressing an issue here. He says, I implore Euodia and I implore Syntaki to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So what we see here is Paul is now addressing a quarrel, an issue that is taking place between these two women. You have Yodia and you have Syntaki. And notice here that Paul doesn't take sides, but he urges these women to end this dispute, to be like-minded. And then in verse 3, he urges a true companion. We don't know who that is. Some scholars suggest it could have been Epaphroditus, um, along with another individual named Clement and others that were doing the Lord's work. And we're, we, what we see here is that Paul's asking for help outside of the quarrel for these individuals to help these women, possibly individuals that with greater spiritual maturity and judgment. And as believers, we know that when any type of issue arises, the Word of God tells us what we are supposed to do. Matthew 18, 15 through 17 tells us, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So disagreements in the body of Christ, they're going to happen. You think about your own family, right? You're a family. There's going to be disagreements within your own family. And we are a church family, which means there's likely going to be disagreements as well. And I strongly believe that a lot of these disagreements, they stem from misunderstanding. And um, personally, I went through a season just like that very recently. A season that I can describe as being very painful. A season where I made mistakes, but also the Lord taught me a lot of things in that season. I truly believe as believers, we need to be more understanding towards one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Especially in difficult times, 
we really don't know what somebody is really going through unless we're really walking um, in their shoes. And this is certainly something I know I could have done better. Um, but at the same time, I feel like I could have also been understood better as well. But regardless, I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to put that behind me and continue moving, um, continue moving forward um, in the Lord with the focus being on Jesus. And this is why we need to be united in Christ. Um, the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even in the midst of the chaos, in the misunderstanding, that's what we have to hold on to because he doesn't change. We change, but he doesn't change. And one of the biggest lessons I learned was that we desperately need each other. We cannot be out of fellowship for extended periods of time because that can lead to those misunderstandings and the division. I also learned that brothers and sisters in Christ are within grasp, right? We just have to knock on those doors. If we need help, if we need counsel, we are not a burden to one another. In fact, the Bible tells us in Galatians 6 2 to bear or to support one another's burden. And, and that's why I'm so excited with these small groups that are arising within our church because we have each other we need each other i need you guys you know we need each other hopefully you guys need me too but we need each other of course um and you know these disputes need to be settled because the focus should never be on us but on jesus because the second the focus is no longer on jesus we've already failed as the body and um because i can't save people only jesus can and that's where the focus needs to be I'm so grateful for what the Word of God tells us in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 23. That the Lord's love is steadfast and never-ending, and His mercies are new every morning, and His faithfulness is great. So as I went through that season, now it's behind me. I'm so grateful that the Lord's mercies are new every morning, and He's able to forgive us. But I also love what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, verse 8. He says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And I love this because we should love each other enough that we can overlook those sins or those wrongdoings that maybe a brother or a sister in Christ did towards us. However, they still have to confess those things to the Lord, right? Only the Lord can, can forgive them. Um, but in terms of our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we're able to overlook those things. Not get mad, not get even, but get over it and, and move on. Put the focus back on Jesus, to be Christ-minded, to be like-minded. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul tells us here, he says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship in, um, any fellowship, brother, of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That's a hard one. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And as I'm sharing these personal things with you, what I want you to see and understand is it doesn't matter who comes up here, whether it's me, another pastor, another leader, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. And we need each other. We need you guys. We need each other. And, you know, we're all a work in progress until we see the Lord face to face. We're, we're beggars trying to show other beggars where to find bread, who we are. And um, that's why we need to be Christ-minded. Because if we're divided like the world, how are we supposed to win the world for Christ, for Christ if we look and we act like the world does? We can't do that. We have to be different. And the only way we can be different is if we're Christ-minded and we're representing the love of Jesus Christ wherever we go and wherever we are as a body and individually. So the second thing we're going to look at this morning um, encompasses verses 4 through 5. And here, Paul talks about rejoicing in the Lord. And in verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. And I love this because it's, um, it's very specific. 
and it's not hard. He says, rejoice in one thing. Is it our money? Is it our cars? Is it our, you know, the relationships we in? What do we rejoice in? Well, it's the Lord. That's the only thing we need to rejoice in. And when? Sometimes? No, he says here, always. And once again, this reminds me of something I mentioned earlier. It reminds me of Paul and Silas when they were thrown into prison, when they took that spirit, um, that foretelling spirit out of that woman there in Philippi. If you look at Acts 16, beginning in verse 25. Okay, so think about this. Paul and Silas are there in prison, and the Word of God tells us, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Right, So here they are rejoicing in the Lord, even though they were in prison. Um, and then suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. So what we see here, if you continue reading there in the book of Acts, is that it opened up the opportunity for them to share the love of the Lord amongst these individuals, of the Philippian jailer and his household, but also the, the other inmates were hearing them worship the Lord. So as we rejoice in the Lord always, you know, does that mean we're not going to have seasons where we're mourning or where we're sad or we, where we are angry? Um, absolutely not, because we're still in the flesh. However, we have to remember that those seasons and even those feelings are temporary and we can still rejoice in the eternal living God, even though we're going through a difficult time. And when we do that, when we rejoice in the Lord, regardless of what circumstance is happening in our lives, people see that. And they're going to say, there's something different about this person. He's going through all of this. But look at him. He's joyful. He's happy. What is that? Well, it's the Lord, right? It's not us. And when we do that, just like Paul and Silas, it can open up the door. It can open up the opportunity for us to minister and to lead people to Jesus Christ. And that's what we're called to do, right? That is the great commission, right? Not the great suggestion. That is what we're called to do. We want to rejoice in the Lord always. And when we do that, we can fulfill what the Lord commands us through Paul in verse 5, where it says, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, that word gentleness there. Uh, the original Greek word is, um, and I'm going to probably mispronounce it, epi, epiikis. I think it's epiikis. And that means a mildness. It means a patience, a yielding, a gentleness, a clemency, a moderation. So what the word of God is telling us here is that they want us to show, or he wants us to show a gentleness towards everybody, all the people around us. And it's so easy to show gentleness towards people that are just like us, right? They have you know, the same political views, they have the same values, they have the same lifestyle. It's easy to do that. But we want to show this gentleness to everyone. And in my opinion, even more so towards those that are not in Christ, those that don't have the same political views, you know, those that don't think like we do, right? Um, because often we think that when people are not in Christ, or they don't have the same political views, or they don't have the same lifestyle, or the same values, we often think that they are the enemy. But in essence, the true enemy is the hardening of our own hearts and the quenching of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we have to be very careful. Remember, God's desire is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I'm so grateful for his patience with me because, I mean, I don't know where I would be right now if it weren't for the Lord. And I'm grateful for his, his patience with me. I was a diff I'm still a difficult person, but I, I try to think of, of it that way. I have to show my gentleness towards these individuals because somebody did it to me. And now I have a hope and I have a future. So he's coming back soon. We want to be busy doing these things that he's called us to do, being those vessels to channel that love and that gentleness. And I'll tell you this right now. We're, we are not going to change people's hearts. We can't do that. Only God can do that. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can do that. Um, because... I've tried changing people's hearts and it's very draining and distressing because you can't do it. Only God can do it. But what we can do is be gentle and loving just like Jesus Christ. And we have to be careful too because love is not tolerance. If you love someone enough, you're going to want to direct them in the right direction to repent and to come to Jesus Christ. So love is not tolerance. I think that's a big issue in our society today is tolerance apparently equals love now. Um, but we have to be careful of that. 
If you love someone enough, you're going to want them to turn to the Lord and, um, and have a hope in the future. All right, so the third thing we're going to see this morning, and this is going to um, cover verses 6 through 7, is to be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. So here in verse 6, he says, or Paul writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, Billy Graham once said that anxiety is the natural result when our hopes are centered in anything short of God and his will for us. And when I think about the Apostle Paul, this guy knew a thing or two about anxiety and worry. And when you think about Paul, for example, when he had this transformation on his way to Damascus, remember, he, um, he was going to that place to bring back believers from the early church in chains, right, to Jerusalem. And what ends up happening is he has this experience, and he ends up leaving that place in a basket through a hole in the wall there in the city of Damascus. Uh, Paul, you think about the shipwrecks and the beatings, the thorn in the side of his flesh. I mean, it's endless with Paul, these difficulties that he faced for the purposes of the gospel and for the people that he was serving. The Lord was using him to serve. And the word here commands us that we need to be anxious for nothing and to pray about everything and to be thankful for everything. And personally, that's easier said and read than done. And prayer, when you think about prayer, it's this broad term for our communication with the Lord. Uh, supplication is like when you specifically ask the Lord for something or to do something. But what we need to understand is that we can pray anywhere. Jonah prayed from the belly of a large fish. Peter, I always think about Peter when I'm in distress. You know, he's sinking in the Sea of Galilee. Three words, save me, Lord. And the Lord saved him. So we're able to pray anywhere. There's no special settings or circumstances that needs us around prayer. Pray in your car. Pray right now. We can pray all day long if we want to. And I love what God tells us through his word in Romans 8.26 through Paul. Sometimes we don't even have the ability to put into words the things that are on our heart that we want to pray for. But what I love that it says here, it says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And I love that. But currently, I'm reading a book called Radical Prayer. It's by an individual named Manny Mill. Um, that book hasn't been canceled yet. So, so we're reading, I'm reading that book right now. And, you know, it's, it's been very convicting to me. It's been challenging me personally, my own private personal prayer life uh, with the Lord. And I truly believe as the body, prayer is one of our weakest areas. And, uh, you know, that, that's my opinion. Those are my thoughts on that. But the book, it was published a few, a few years ago. It states that 80% of evangelical pastors do not have a personal private prayer life. And when you read those statistics, you're thinking to yourself, within the people that they are leading, what do their prayer lives look like? It's probably non-existent just like their pastors. And this is a tool that we need to utilize. Prayer is extremely powerful. And when I think about prayer meetings, prayer gatherings at the church, those are the least attended events. You could bring food and people still don't come to the prayer meetings or the prayer gatherings. Um, Leonard Ravenhill once said, No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is plain. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. And that's, that's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. And you ask yourself, well, why do we avoid these times of prayer? Why do we do that? Well, the book suggests that there are three basic fears that keep us or block our path from prayer. Number one, we fear having our sins exposed. Number two, such exposure of our sins leads to the fear of pain. And that pain comes from spiritual transformation and the uprooting of self and replacing me, myself, and I with the triune God. And that can be painful, right? Um, and then thirdly, and this is the big one, the fear of losing control. 
when we seek others help in prayer in a sense what we're doing is we're indicating a willingness to surrender and let god's will be done in our lives and that can be hard because i admit i wake up in the morning i want isaac's will to be done and that's where i have to crucify my flesh and have the lord fill me afresh with his holy spirit that way his will can be done in my my day and in my life a particular uh, situation that i'm going through you know maybe these are the reasons why we don't like to pray corporately or even personally. But the fact is, God wants to hear from us. And when you think about prayer, you know, the Word of God describes them as these sweet smelling aromas onto the Lord. You think about Psalm 114.2, there the psalmist writes, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And truly, my heart, my desire for us as a church here is that we're a church that prays. We don't just come here like on Sundays and like just play church. Like we're praying because the labor comes when we're on our knees crying out to the Lord, fighting for our marriages, fighting for our kids, fighting for the ministries, fighting for our pastors, fighting for this church in the world that we're currently living in. That's where the power is. And that's where our hearts should be as well, because that's where all the labor should be going in. Now, throughout scripture, you think about prayer warriors. There's prayer warriors peppered throughout scripture. I think about Daniel. I think about Nehemiah. Um, but of course, Jesus Christ, like the greatest example, the only living example we have of, of God the Father, right? You think about his agonizing prayer there in the garden of Gethsemane, right? The night before he was betrayed. The word of God tells us here in Matthew chapter 26, and I'll reference this in just a second, that he didn't just pray this once, twice, but three times. And there beginning in uh, verse 36 of Matthew 26, the word of God tells us, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, right? So he's with his disciples. And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face, prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And when we pray like that, it sends heaven crashing down to earth, and mountains are moved, the impossible becomes impossible. God is so good. We just have to cry out to him and ask him for the things that he knows we already need, but he wants to hear uh, from us. Now, let's talk a little bit about the anxieties and the worries because those are copious and they're everywhere, right? We, we deal with these things every single day. Now, when we don't take those things to the Lord, things start to happen. Um, when we're anxious and we're worried, we and quickly become overcome with the circumstance. And in fact, Pastor Angel talked a little bit about this when he talked through First Samuel, it was 13 and 14. That was two weeks ago. When he talked through that section there, when we are overwhelmed with our circumstances, then the disobedience comes and things do not go very well for us. And remember, the Word of God tells us in First Peter 5, 8, to be sober-minded, right? To be calm, collected in spirit, to be vigilant, because your adversary, our adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. When we're anxious and we're worried, we're overcome with our circumstances, that is a great opportunity for the enemy to eat us alive. And in the midst of being confused and overwhelmed with our circumstances, we start to seek counsel outside of the Lord. And what happens when we do this is something that always comes to my mind. But but we leave things to the Lord as a last resort. We say, well, I have tried everything. I guess I will pray. We inquire of the Lord last instead of first. And the thing is, once you start to seek counsel outside of the Lord, outside of the body, uh, things can get a lot worse, right? And we start to question the Lord. Why is this happening to me? Why have you allowed this? It kind of reminds me of the book of Micah 
towards the end of the, the book there in chapter six, the last chapter there, um, the Lord asks the children of Israel, what have I done to you? Of course, he's speaking about the rebellion and the rejection of the Lord there. And often we do the same thing. You know, Lord, what did I do to you? What did I do to deserve this um, in my life? We think to ourselves, you should be rewarding me because I'm walking with you. You shouldn't be punishing me, right? Why are you punishing me? And when I was thinking about this, it, it kind of reminded me of, of my day job. So when I'm not here serving uh, the Lord alongside with you guys, I actually teach chemistry and physics at an early college high school. And even at that level, we have to implement this so-called kindergarten tactics where when my students are good, I reward them. But when they are bad, I punish them. And, you know, right now the struggle is those cell phones. <laughs> you know, they're always on these apps, uh, TikTok and Instagram. I tell them these things are destroying your life. Um, but they don't listen. But anyways, that's another sermon. That's another teaching. Unfortunately for a lot of us, that kindergarten way of thinking, it transfers into our spiritual life. And we think to ourselves, just because I'm going through a difficult time, um, that means that God is punishing me. But if I'm going through a great time in my life, then God is rewarding me. Um, but that isn't so. And when I think about this, it reminds me of Job. You think about the life of Job as we read through the book of Job. Um, Job, his friends in their earthly and worldly counsel, they were telling him, you're suffering because you are in sin. And of course, we know that the Lord had had this conversation with the enemy and gave him permission to touch Job's life. And what I'm not suggesting here is that, you know, just because you're in sin, um, you know, when you are in sin, there are going to be consequences. There, there will be suffering when you are in sin, right? The disobedience to God leads to consequences. You know, in fact, Pastor Angel talked about that last week in 1 Samuel 15. Our disobedience to the Lord will have consequences. But remember, just because we're walking with the Lord doesn't mean we're not going to have difficulties. And we know this and we still can get it sometimes. I know I have difficulties. I'm, I'm just hard-headed. I don't know. I mean, God knows the, the thing that's up here speaking to you guys. But it's all right. He is, he is, he's forgiving and he loves us. But anyways, he tells us, in the world you will have tribulation. We know this. And we still can accept it. Um, and when we think this way, like kindergartners, you know, I'm, I'm being punished or I'm being rewarded, we lose sight of God and we're just asking why, why. Why? And this is what happened to Job, right? He got into this vicious cycle of why. And he actually became bitter and he started complaining. And if you read through Job, it's interesting because you don't hear for God, from God. Um, it, it took like 30 some chapters until God speaks back to Job. So if you look at Job 38, chapter 38, there we see the Lord finally responding to Job, revealing his unending power. And he speaks to Job out of a whirlwind. And um, I find this Heart here quite frightening and I think about like my own parents and, and I'll talk about what I mean here but anyways here Job instead of him asking the questions God starts asking him the questions and if you look at verse 2 there in chapter 38 um, the word of God says there and this is the Lord speaking who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge now prepare yourself like a man I will question you and you will answer me I mean, that's pretty scary. I mean, it's scary when your earthly parents start questioning you. But can you imagine our Heavenly Father questioning us? Uh, that's terrifying. And if you read through the, the 38th chapter there, he asks them, you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, right? You know, where were you when I commanded the morning um, since your days, I believe is what he says there. But if you read through the rest of the chapter, you know, they play a hundred questions there. But the point is here is that God asked him questions that were simply unanswerable. And this was meant to show Job what, that he really had no place to ask God these questions. And likewise for us, like who are we to demand answers from the Lord? Who are we to question um, the Lord? And if you continue reading through Job, you'll see that eventually his outcome is, is a glorious one. He's blessed with twice as much as he had lost. And the thing is, he would ne never really get an answer as to why. Like, he really didn't know this conversation that God had had with the enemy. And I think for many of us in this room, when we go through terrible seasons, these anxieties, these worries, we may never have an answer as to why God let that happen. However, what we do know about the Lord 
is that he's trying to shape us and to mold us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, his son. The only living example we have of him, God the Father. And the only way he can do that is by taking us through the fire and refining us, removing that dross, right, and making us pure, just like his son. We won't be perfected on this side of heaven, but that's what he's doing. Remember what we're told here in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Not if, but when you fall, right? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, right? So these difficulties, they don't necessarily produce our faith, they test our faith. And that's why we have to be in the Word of God, because our faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And we have to be consumed with those things. We'll talk more about that in just a second here. But he's trying to shape us, he's trying to mold us. And that's what we have to focus on, not so much the, the circumstance or the anxiety. Now, to add insult to injury, if we're overtaken by our anxieties and our worries, often we start to let old sinful habits come back into our lives. And sometimes we justify them. We're like, you know, I'm, I'm better where I was spiritually. You know, it's okay if I drink that or I watch that or I do that. You know, just a little is not going to hurt. But remember, when you give the enemy an inch, he takes a yard, right? So we have to be very, very careful. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. Proverbs 26, 11 tells us this. We have to be very, very careful. So once again, the Lord commands us here not to be anxious for anything, but to pray about everything. Like, okay, we get it. We get it. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, but personally, once again, sometimes when I do that, those anxieties and those worries, they just come back to me. You wake up the same way. What do you do? Well, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast your cares to him because he cares for you. And of course, here he's, he's speaking to uh, persecuted saints there that had been scattered abroad. Now, the word of God tells us here that, um, you know, he says cares. That translates to anxiety as if you look that word up there. But every time I read this verse, it uh, reminds me of the game of basketball. Now, let me be very clear. I was never the athletic type. Um, I was in the marching band. That, that pretty much settled it, right? Um, but I think of basketball. You can think of the anxieties and the worries as this ball, the basketball. And every time you're holding that ball, you've got to pass it back to the Lord. It comes back to you, you pass it back to the Lord. You can't be that ball hog. We can't be the anxiety and the worries and the circumstance hog. We have to give it to the Lord. That way he can settle that for us. I know this is easier said than done, but that's something we have to fight for every single day. And when we do that, we can experience what Paul says here in verse 7. He says, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And this is awesome. This is a beautiful promise. You know, often we pray and we tell people, may you have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. But really, how do we really experience that? What does that mean? Well, we know it's only through salvation that we can experience that peace of God. So in thinking about this, it, it reminded me of the youth group here. So, so I leave the youth group here, and we're currently going through the Gospel of Luke. And there's actually a section in there, it's in the second chapter, where Jesus is dedicated to the Lord there in the temple by his mother Mary and Joseph. And um, when, he, when they do that, we're introduced to an individual named Simeon. Okay, And the Word of God describes Simeon as this just and devout individual that was waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Israel um, by the coming of the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that he would not see death um, before he saw the Lord's Christ, speaking of Jesus. And God gives him this opportunity to see Jesus. If you look at Luke 2, verses 28 through 33, it says there, He, speaking of Simeon, took him up. So he picked up Jesus in his arms. And he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. So in that, um, in that reference there in Luke, what we see is that Simeon actually picks up salvation. He picks up Jesus, and he holds it. And as believers, all of us in this room, we have seen salvation. 
and you're like, well, wait, I haven't seen Jesus. And, um, and I don't know if this is a cultural thing, but I think a lot of us, our abuelitas have pictures of Jesus in their, in their, um, in their kitchen, but that doesn't count. Okay. You haven't seen him face to face yet. But what I'm suggesting here is that we've seen salvation through the life of Jesus in the word of God, through the gospel message that's peppered throughout the word of God. It all points to the gospel. And when we put our faith in that message, we've been able to see salvation and to experience salvation. And of course, we know that when we receive the gospel message, right? Number one, that Jesus died for our sins. Number two, that Jesus was buried. Number three, that he rose from the dead three days later. You recognize you're a sinner and there's that element of repentance in your life. That, Romans 3.22 tells us, we're found righteous in the sight of God. And when we're found righteous in the sight of God, we have God's favor. And we're at a place where we have peace with God. But Paul here is talking about the peace of God. What does this mean? Well, I like to think about it this way. We're able to grab on to God's peace, just like Simeon grabbed on to baby Jesus. And when we grab on to God's peace, um, we're abiding in him, we're obedient to him, we're you know, giving him our anxieties and our worries, we're letting everything go. It's like carrying a heavy box and just dropping it. And that peace, can then enter our hearts. It can guard our minds. That's the peace that sustains us. We're letting go of the control we thought we had of our lives, and we're letting God take over. And when we do that, we can experience that peace that surpasses all understanding. We're safely in his hands. That is what the peace of God is. You're literally holding on to him and holding on to that peace. And the fact that we have access to that peace every single day Every single moment of our lives, that's a blessing. And I can tell you that peace has certainly been sustaining me and my family for the past several years, but especially over the past six months. Um, the past six months have been extremely difficult for us. Um, probably the worst six months, I would say, of my life in terms of the circumstances, not walking with the Lord, but circumstances. As many of you know, I moved back to El Paso a few years ago. This is my hometown from Colorado. Um, in 2016, my mom had a massive brain hemorrhage and it just, it changed her life. It changed all of our lives, um, in many different ways. I'm one of her primary caregivers and, and recently I've also been caring, um, for my dad. And I can tell you as a caregiver during this pandemic, during these difficult times, uh, it has been extremely challenging. The decisions that God has put on my heart to make for my parents and for my family have led to a lot of criticism, a lot of misunderstanding, and that has been extremely difficult for me. I have never in my life been in a position like that before as a caregiver, decisions I had to make for my mom, for my dad, and, and, and for my family in general. But God knew what was happening in that situation and in my heart, so that's been very difficult for me. But also, between October of last year and January of this year, so then within that five-month um, span there, we also had five family members pass away. Many of those were due to the pandemic. And um, some of those deaths were even days apart from each other. And the hardest thing for me, I mean, I know we have victory over death. I know that death has lost its thing. But the hardest thing for me was not having that opportunity to say bye to those individuals because of what was happening with the pandemic. And when you sit and have time to think about that, you can't help but think that your loved ones died alone. Um, and those are thoughts you have to take captive because I know the Lord will be with them. And when you don't take those thoughts captive, it will consume you. And you start asking why and you get back into that vicious cycle. We have to be very careful. Um, so on top of all the grief and difficulty, a few weeks ago, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. So we're about to enter this new area of uncharted waters his um you know the the prognosis looks promising however there's still a lot of unknowns that we have with my dad and um i love my dad very much but i know god loves him more and um as we're going through all of these difficulties these anxieties these worries mourning and and the grief and and just the unknown we can still have the peace of god in our lives because of the peace that we have with god in our lives. Now, does that mean we're not going to have bad days or bad moments? Absolutely not. We have a lot of those. But we have to remember that those moments, those days, those feelings are only temporary. And we can still have the peace of God 
even though we're going through those things, simply by holding on to him, holding on to the Lord. You know, I think of Simeon still in my head there as he held Jesus. So no matter what you all are facing in this room right now, because we're all going through something, um, you can still have that peace of God in your life, but you have to hold fast to God. And that's something you have to choose every single day. It's not something that you in the flesh can choose, but the Spirit will choose for you. And um, I, I, I can assure you, in my heart, I, I truly believe that the best is still yet to come in, in Christ Jesus. He's good. God is good. Always. And that's why we always have to rejoice um, in the Lord. All right, so the last two verses here, um, notice here that Paul tells us, beginning in verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, um, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And I love this here because Paul reminds us that we need to take all those thoughts captive, right? He tells us specifically what to meditate on. And when we don't meditate on those things, other thoughts, other things come into our mind. We have to take those thoughts captive and put them into obedience with Christ. And you think about it, that battle, it always begins in the mind. I know for me, the battle always begins in the mind and I have to crucify those thoughts. Get rid of them because they can eventually make it into your heart, become a part of your character and turn into an actual action which is sin, right? So be careful. Uh, verse 9, this is the last verse. It says, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So here we read something that is very reminiscent of what Paul told the church in Corinth. If you look at Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the first letter, uh, 11, verse 1, it says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So when we do that, when we imitate Christ, we become more like the Lord. We, we want to be more like the Lord. We desire to run after him. That will allow us to have peace with God. And then that way we can experience the peace of God, uh, regardless of what seasons we are going through. So in closing, just four things I want us to remember um, before we leave. Uh, number one, we need to be Christ-minded. We need to be united in Christ, in the Lord. Number two, we need to rejoice in the Lord always. Not just sometimes, but always. Number three, don't be anxious for anything, but pray about everything. Be thankful for everything. If you pray and nothing happens, keep praying. Fourthly, we want to imitate Christ. And when we imitate Christ, then we're able to experience that peace of God that will fill our hearts and will guard our minds. Isaiah 26.3 tells us, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Amen. So this morning, um, if you're here in person or you're watching uh, via the, the Internet and um, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you're tired of wrestling with the anxieties and the worries and just all the uncertainties that this world has to bring and you want to declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, I want to give you that opportunity. So if that's you this morning, if you could please bow your head, close your eyes, believers, please pray, and repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I want to invite you into my life. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I recognize that I am a sinner and in need of a Savior, Lord. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. Amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Church. We hope that Pastor Angel's message blessed you this morning. We want to encourage you to spread the gospel by sharing this message through social media. If you want more information about Fresh Vision Church, such as our service time, how to get connected, or you want to hear current or past studies, please visit our website at fvcelp.org. If you're interested in donating to the Ministry of Fresh Vision Church, there is a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Church. We pray that you have a blessed week, and we hope to see you again soon.